want you. Father, Lord, we thank you very much for gathering us here today. We thank you for bringing us together as family and friends of a great man, the late William Odongo Mamo. We thank you that we are gathered here to celebrate his life and his legacy through the launch of a book that he started working on. Lord, it has been 12 long years, but Lord, your time is the best time. And we thank you that we were finally able to launch the work of a great man. So as we gather here today, Lord, I pray that you may be with us, that we may listen to those who have come to speak to us, and that you may touch each and every one of us. I pray all this, trusting and believing in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Ari. Thank you very much. Let me take this early opportunity to welcome you to this occasion. My name, which I've just remembered after the cup of tea, is Kenneth Ayuko. I've had the privilege of having been a mentee of Dr. William Odongo Mamo, a mentee in a professional way. He was my minister after all. I'm an agriculturalist, and William Odongo Omamo was my minister. I've had the occasion post that relationship also to interact with him in different capacities when he was chairman of Mumia Sugar, 
when he was chairman of the Masena University Council, when he was chairman of AFC, and then when he was just chairman general. We are here sitting at the, this is the auditorium, or just the hall. The conference hall of the Department of Humanities of the United States University, International University, Africa. You have to get those things right. Sometimes it's get, it gets confusing. This is not the one in Nigeria, Africa. Since I don't have, I'm not qualified to welcome people to USIU. I would like to call on the USIU alumni chair. He's the guy who is, looks the opposite of me. He has a full sock of hair. I don't. And uh, probably <laughs> to make short remarks <laughs> and welcome us to this institution. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's usually perfect to be asked to speak first, especially when you see the list of speakers, uh, because uh, I might set the bar too high. So I might want to, you know. Um, but it's great to see you at USIU. Welcome to USIU. USIU, our alma mater. Um, we studied with Bob. Bob was ahead of me. Uh, luckily, uh, when we were in USIU, Bob's go-to statement was, but I went to Alliance. <laughs> so I think now I can say, but I went to school with Bob. But today is not about Bob. Uh, it's about honoring this great gentleman. And there is one important thing that you've talked about, legacy. And which is what USIU has instilled in us. And we're happy to see a parent who grew that, that legacy, right? We want to support students. Um, at the back there, you, we are supported by classmates, friends. We've known, we've known each other for almost 15 years. So our friendships have lasted. And it's great when we hear about someone who mentored you 6.5 decades and in the making. So it's interesting to read a book about a person who was one of the first pioneers of O-level education. It's great to read about one of the first ministers. Um, it's great because mentorship is not only one-on-one. -on -one. Mentorship is also in this book. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, to the Omamo family for choosing USIU. We support you. Uh, we are happy to, to have you here. And being USIU alumni, we have one thing as alumni. We say we are the ambassadors of USIU. So anytime you go out there, if you hear someone who wants to go to USIU or someone who wants to go to university and get world-class education, like you said, USIU is United States International Africa. We like to call ourselves the Harvard of Africa. Please feel free to come and visit us. To all our guests, feel free to come back, speak to our students. We have a lot of programs as the Alumni Association, uh, both in mentorship, both in career building, that we would like you to plug in. So, it's great to have all of you, and thank you so much for coming, and uh, enjoy your evening. Congratulations, Bob, and the entire family, and uh, we will continue to support you guys in, as we move forward, and we wish you all the best. Thank you so much. There are those among us here who had even a more intense, a more closer relate other than the family a closer uh, interaction at the professional and the official level
One of those is another illustrious son of Kenya. He was a technocrat, a permanent secretary in nine ministries. Correct me if I'm wrong, if I got that one wrong. And as technocrats, when we finish our technocracy, which is where we are supposed to be doing policy, then we think policy is not very well done at technocracy. So we do, we go to the arena where policy is informed by our political leaning. Hence the definition uh, politics as being a body for making policy. <laughs> Mr. Simeon Sirma served and worked with Dr. Kaliyaj for a number of years. He knows I don't know. And therefore, instead of hazarding making a mistake, I'm going to invite for this next presentation or this next talk. Mr. Simeon Lesirma, who was a technocrat and later on a policymaker. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, our uh, guest speakers, um, the Mama family. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is uh, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to to stand uh, in front of you to speak. Uh, this is uh, an ambush because I've not been to many book launches. I was not prepared to come and speak, and I didn't want to speak because the book speaks of itself. Um, uh, I read, I was given this book uh, by Robert on the 6th of September, the three months ago. And so when I saw serialization, I ignored uh, because I, I, I already read the book. It's also a pleasure to be back here because I've just been reminded by Robert that we graduated together in the year 2003. So we are alumni of uh, uh, this great university. Uh, 2003 is a long time. Um, I knew Kaliech 45 years ago. Um, Mumi and Shoe Company was just being established, I believe, around 1974. Also, and uh, that time I was working with Minister of Home Affairs as a personal assistant to the Deputy Commissioner of Prisons. And I saw the reason for joining Home, home Affairs and Prisons in particular, was a, it was a government experiment uh, to take about 12 graduates in police and, uh, and, and prisons. But uh, the intention of some of us particularly myself, my intention was to go to pursue studies in criminology at the University of Kele, Kele or Kele in Britain. And I was a bit disappointed. I uh, attended an interview uh, and uh, a few weeks later, I got a circular type of a type thing signed by somebody I'm not going to mention now, uh, telling me that I'm not qualified. So I got a bit frustrated. I couldn't go for a master's degree. So one one day I, I saw in the newspaper, uh, a vacancy exists <coughs> in um, agricultural enterprise in Western Kenya. I didn't know what it was and was advertised by Hawkins and Associates, and I applied. I appeared before the panel. The sugar company was run by then by Buka Agriculture International. And the interview took a very short time. 
one they were uh, very happy to find the kind of person they wanted. They were looking somebody who who was not a Luo and not a Luya. And uh, <laughs> I come from Samburu County. <laughs> and and the interview, I, I, I think it took about 10, 10 or 20 minutes. There was a queue. I knew I was not qualified. Uh, because although I did <laughs> criminology, psychology, and social work at Makere University, <laughs> I, I knew I didn't have in, industrial experience other than attachment to uh, BAT. So immediately these Mzungus who are appearing before Hawkins and Associates, immediately they saw a Samburu, a graduate. They stopped the interview for all the other candidates. <laughs> And they told me to report to Kagen House and see the chairman. And uh, when I appeared there, um, I found this man who spoke, you know, uh, when we were in class seven, class six, primary schools, uh, the people who spoke English very well were the Lewis. We used to, to say that they spoke Kong English. <laughs> and the first thing he told me, young man, um, uh, my name is uh, William Owamo. I'm a nominated member of parliament and I'm executive chairman. And we've been looking for you <laughs> because there is polarization. He liked using very uh, uh, big words. There is polarization, Mumias. There is uh, a conflict between uh, the Luos and the Luyas, and we are happy we've got a Samburu. And never mind about your qualifications. You will be reporting to me, the executive chairman. The Zamzungu is the CEO. You are to implement company policy. Particularly, uh, you are supposed to recruit um, supervisory staff and management trainees from as many tribes of Kenya as possible. And, uh, and we have company policies which you have to uh, follow. The second, um, instructions I'm giving you is that you will only recruit from British universities and Nairobi University. And I believe that time, 76, I think Edgerton University, Edgerton was not a university, it was a college. You will take supervisory staff from the agricultural college at Edgerton. And then uh, lower cadres you take from the Ahitis. And uh, you will be reporting to me through the, you reported to the Mzungu general manager, but you report to me. We have challenges in Mumias. We have challenges of safety uh, accidents in the factory. We have challenges uh, of theft, theft of equipment, theft of tractors, theft of sugar cane. This is 1976. So the stories you read about the papers, uh, about mumias are not, you know, the culture of thievery uh, <laughs> was there <laughs> even that time. And uh, so I embarked on, uh, on my job and he sent me direct there. And uh, I reported uh, to work and one day, he wanted to employ a relative. And this relative went to not a Hittis, but the farmers, large scale farmers training college, Nyaururu. You know, that was, you had the diploma, a jeton, then you had the Ahitis, Embu, Bukura. Then below that, those years, you had the large scale farmers. And uh, so he told me, look at this man, I want you to employ him. 
and coming from where I come from, <laughs> I told you, Mr. Chairman, your instructions were that I employ only AIDs. <laughs> your, your relative is not an AID graduate. He said, okay, no problem. <laughs> Continue to apply the policy. Now, I don't want to speak long because uh, I, I'm not, I was not in the program, but I want to congratulate the Omamo family because uh, in this book, I learned a lot of things. I learned a lot about culture, the Luo culture. Most of us, when we are told about Nyanza, uh, we, we talk about South Nyanza. This book will tell you there is a place called North Nyanza. Uh, this book will tell you uh, a lot of things about literature and so on, but I don't want to spoil uh, the story. Uh, when Robert called me to say that uh, he understood that I had worked with his father, uh, I told him, yes, we can meet. I look at the book and I think about 16 or so chapters. And my biggest disappointment was there was no chapter on Mumias <laughs> because he was my chairman from 1976 to 1981. And uh, of course he told me, that's your problem. Robert told me that's your problem. Put that chapter in your book. <laughs> you, are now, you are now 76 years old. <laughs> you ought to be writing a book. <laughs> And I've not taken that challenge. Um, I've not taken that challenge, and I hope uh, I'm still uh, pro procrastinating about it, like most people of my generation. You say, "I'll write, I'll write, I'll write." But the other fear we we have as uh, the master of ceremony mentioned that I was a technocrat in various ministries is that you know too much. And one relative advised me, please, never ever attempt to write a book. Never. You know too much. And two things can happen to you. <laughs> you, can, you can be killed or you can offend many, many, many people. So I need, I'm sealed. Looking around, maybe I need some legal advice uh, uh, to talk along with me because um, uh, I don't want to be in trouble. So uh, with those uh, many remarks, congratulations. Uh, I don't want to say many things about the book because I've read it. Uh, congratulations and uh, uh, to you and I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you very much. Also, ceremony. Thank you. Thank you, Buena PS. Thank you. Buena MP. Thank you, Buena Technocrat in Mumias. Thank you, man of many hearts. Nazarali had joined Ejaton in 1965 and was second year in 1966 when Dr. William Odongo Mamo uh, joined. Nazarali was a Tanzanian and after Ejaton, there were the extracts and uh, beneficiaries of the Aga Khan uh, Development Network who wanted to train uh, Tanzanians of Indian extraction in the nitty gritties and the technicalities of managing agricultural enterprise in Tanzania. As luck would have it, most of that private enterprise was nationalized towards the end of the 60s. And Nazarali and his ilk migrated to all corners of the world. There is a big community of Egerton alumni. The oldest is, I think, Dr. Lukmanje, who was in Egerton in 1962. He's still alive. Together, 
with that large number, they form what we call the Edgerton Alumni Global. I'm privileged to be a member of that global association, but I don't say. The presentation you are going to get next, Sadu Nazarali is with us via video. He has recorded and sent us a message of what he thinks and what they thought of Dr. William Odongo Mamo. Principal William Odongo Omamo. This is Sadhu Nazarali from Edmonton, Canada. It's minus 30 here with snow on the ground. Professor Omamo never told us that we had to farm in this weather. But there's one thing he taught us, to work hard and adapt to the situations. Today, we, the Edgerton alumni from Canada, USA, UK, pay tribute to this great man on launching of his book in Nairobi this Thursday. We also have a great memory of Madame Joyce at our Kennedy Dining Hall. Madame, I used to get extra beef, I remember that. I remember reading about his first day in school in Tacoma. I was half naked with only a goat skin to cover my private parts and my buttock. From that, he finished the high school, got a scholarship to go to Punjab Agriculture College, the top in India at that time, and a PhD in Oregon State University. But my coincidence was Professor Omamo started in January, February 65. I arrived at Edgerton in June 65 when Michael Barrett who was the chairman of the board, Sir Michael Blundell, and Mr. Barrett, Professor Barrett was the principal and Professor Omama was a deputy vice principal and his principalship took over in my second year in 1966. I remember one day encountering with him on, 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 on the campus. My boys, what are you doing today? So we talked a little bit. He said, have fun, party, but study well. This is your only chance that will make you or break you. And that made a lot of change today. Today in North America, we have PhDs in agriculture from Edgerton. We have people who are veterinary surgeons, people who are food inspectors with high paying jobs, people who are devoted to business and, and coma and manufacturing. But many, many of them with social conscience is doing global projects to eliminate poverty. He created the first transformation of Edgerton College from all white farmers' children to multi-racial institution, the best agriculture college south of London, England. His joy of people and sense of humor was always there matching his academic success. And to his children, he also gave you the best of education. From lawyers to medical doctors to culinary hard art to farming. And I remember William Jr. discussing when he took him to his land near Lake Victoria, divided equal land to each one of them teaching you and teaching us leaving wealth for next generation, teaching next generation what to do. And our sweet memory is to meet most of you under Minister Rachel Omamo at our high-level high banquet in Nairobi in 2019 is another highlight. So 
Thanks for taking the initiative in this book. And we all wish you the very best on this launch on Thursday. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sadhu. Thank you, Sadro. And I think Sadro deserves better applause than that one. That sounds like the applause of January when what was Mesota. Give it an applause of December. Yay! After thanking, uh, after having that very beautiful presentation from Sadro Nazarali. I now have the pleasure of inviting the biblical or the Kenyan Isaac Mutemi. So thank you very much for this opportunity to say a few words. Good evening, everybody. So yeah, as you heard, my name is Isaac Mutemi. I had the distinct privilege of being invited by Bob to have a look at his old man's manuscript. And uh, initially, I, I found out later it was actually a bit of a trap. Uh, Bob just, he phrased it as though it was just a friendly look at the manuscript, but he had wanted me to edit the manuscript before I knew what he was up to. So he invited me to just look at it. It was a way for, for him to pull me in closer. And uh, indeed, he was right, because I found it very intriguing. And uh, it wasn't very hard for him to convince me to come and work with him on that. And uh, before I talk about the book and Kaliech, uh, one quick comment about this very interesting engagement you had with Bob on this. So uh, it, it so happens that uh, Bob and I met uh, on uh, platforms and uh, the alumni of Alliance High School. He left Alliance High School in 1999. I joined it in uh, 2003. So a huge gap of years between us. But uh, if we found working on this book, uh, I found it at least very uh, synergetic. It was a very easy experience working on this, uh, partly because we brought different strengths to this. Uh, Bob was a pragmatic, uh, you know, more practical guy. Uh, deadlines, how much is it going to cost, uh, that sort of thing. I was more literary, uh, sort of artistic, and looking at, and also a bit philosophical, looking at what the story is about. And I found it a very interesting tension. Uh, so if you read the book, you might find a very, you might find it very balanced in between. Uh, there's a very practical element to it, but there's also quite a bit of uh, philosophy that comes straight from Kaliet himself, which I'm going to talk about now. Uh, I didn't know Kaliet at all. Uh, at least when he left politics, I I wasn't uh, yet involved or uh, engaged in political conversations. My people will call it, uh, I, had, I was not yet clever. There's a language amongst my people. If you're, not yet if you're not of a certain age, they say you're not yet clever. So I wasn't yet clever when Kaliet left politics. And uh, of course, I had the opportunity to you know, see a, a member of his, of his family in the limelight. And so that's as much as I knew about the story. So when Bob asked me to... Uh, look at the manuscript. In in a very interesting way, it was a blessing that I didn't know anything about the guy because for me, uh, I came into the story with fresh eyes. I had no uh, expectations. I had no uh, you know suppositions of what he was supposed to say. I was just you know fresh page. Tell me what you have to say, and what he had to say was a lot and very very impressive. Uh, and, and that is one part of this story that I hope even as we discuss it and, uh, you know, it gets into our lingo and, uh, you know, uh, gets shared by as many people as we hope can get it. I hope the part, the, the, a huge element of this book just grapples with the humanity of Kaliyach himself. Uh, too frequently, when you're talking about, you know, political actors or bigger than life characters, the political side, the political story tends to overshadow the human side. And the tragedy of that is that, you know, politics by its very definition is partisan. It means that you have to pick sides. It means that it's not for everybody. Uh, you pick your side, either you're for or against, and that's it. But when a story is appealing to your human side, it's universal. It has no limits. It has no, no boundaries for who it approaches, who it appeals to. Everybody who gets a chance to look at it has, a ch has an equal chance of being in involved in the story. 
And that's important. That's extremely important for uh, a few reasons. Uh, number one, uh, it's interesting we're talking about Kaliet and his story in the context that the country is grappling with right now, uh, which I think to pick one of the many themes uh, in the air right now in the country, one of them is inequality uh, and uh, uh, trying to figure out what, where does Kenya go from now uh, with regards to the way our, our country was designed and divided at independence. And uh, from that perspective, you, if you, if you uh, engage the story of Kaliet from just a, a, casual, uh, uh, a casual outlook and say, okay, so who is this guy? There's a temptation to very immediately latch onto, oh, this is one of those dynasties we hear about being talked about. And dynasty right now is a very popular word in, in, in our lingo. And that's, it's, it's a fair point, it's a fair argument to make. Okay, first you hear, oh, this guy was first principal, first African principal of uh, Egerton, first African to get a degree in agricultural economics, first one to get a master's, and like, oh, okay, okay, dynasty. Those are dynasties that we, we keep on, he on hearing about. And that's a, fair, that's a fair accusation. But there's a different side that only comes if you get a chance to, to, to read the story, to engage with the story of how this human being actually traveled the path to get there. And you get to listen, you know, to get to hear about the risks that uh, pertain to this. You get to hear about the, the, you know, the, the mischances. You get to hear about the very close calls that this individual, this gentleman had. And uh, over and above that, because I come from a side of the country, I come, so uh, Kaliech is from the most western side of the country. I come from the lower eastern side of the country. And for, for a variety of uh, geopolitical and other factors, we don't have as much appreciation of the history of this country, where I come from, as there tends to be around the lake region. And so over and above you know, me uh, admiring the story of Khalid the human, I was also interested in oh, what does this say about the place where I come from? And what lessons can I draw from this narrative that makes sense to our people where I come from? And immediately one, one thing that comes to me uh, uh, talking about just the way the country was aggregated and, and, and sort of uh, organized at the, at the, in the lead up to independence is that you have you know, regions of the country that for the reasons that the colonialists and all the other actors best knew, you have regions of the, regions of the country that have a lot more uh, uh, resources. There's there are a lot more advantages that those regions of the country have than others. And that is something that I kept on, as I kept on engaging with the story, I was very curious to ask, so how did this happen? And you hear about Maseno being started in 1906. Maseno features very, very clearly in the story of, of Kaliet. And you ask, how is it that you have one region of the country where there is enough momentum and there are and a lot of, lot of conversations about progress, but, but that by 1906, people are talking about creating a school and it goes on to be a very successful school. There are places in my country, my mom was talking about this, she's in the audience, my mom was talking about this just the other day, that when she went to school in 1960s, uh, she was the first one from her village to go to school. And it was actually a very unique thing that you are actually going to school. And so to, cut, to start to wind down my, some of my comments on this, uh, when you talk about where Kenya is going from now, where do we go from now? One of the lessons that I have taken away from this engagement and this story is that it's very, very important for us to, uh, to begin to revisit the fault lines of how the communities that we, we engage in, how, they would, how the opportunities were, dis were distributed. And I say this, I say this uh, also reflecting on Kaliet himself, because Kaliet talks in, in, a great deal about Maseno, what Maseno means to him, and how, uh, how it reflected with him as a person. And for me, I have uh, lots and lots of reflections, I have, there are lots of things I, I want to do uh, just based on my engagement with this story. I hope that you get a chance to look at this story on your own terms, and I hope it affects you in a way that you also figure out how do I get to impact my own community in the same way that the generation that has preceded us got the opportunity to, to do. So thank you very much, gentlemen and ladies. Isaac, thank you. Uh, Isaac went to Alliance, and so did Bob. I almost also almost went to Alliance. At least I thought about it. <laughs>
used to be the area that uh, Isaac talks about is uh, we used to introduce ourselves by which schools we went to. And as you read the, the Kalish book, some of this comes out, come out. Zamani mama sikuwa hivi Eh mama Hapo zamani mama chauri wa bombe Eh mama Sasa hapo zamani mama sikuwa hivi Eh mama Hapo zamani mama chauri wa bombe yeah mama nijibona jilinga yanje uwebu wa mapu babo yeah mama nijibona jilinga yanje uwebu wa belungu babo yeah mama Ijibona jizula njenjingela kayama weto Eye mama Nijibona njilinka yande uwebu wabelu ngubabo Eye mama Aye mwarenga pulo Sizobu ya I said if we are going to applaud anything, let's give it the applause of December. Yes. Wow. Sometimes I envy the progeny of Kaleh to have had the opportunity to grow under the shadow of that great man. They have stories to tell, probably, that we'll get to know. They also have stories that we can hear today. One of those is Thomas. Not Thomas. Thomas. Otherwise, shortened Tom Omamo. Who I humbly... But joyously, again oxymoron, humbly but joyously, to come and tell us just a bit. I would like to, as your prefect, I would like to restrict the presentations to no more than five minutes. Tom.
Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, good evening. Um, a previous speaker uh, said that uh, um, our dad, Odongo Mamo, had many different sides to him. And uh, to be honest, I think us as his children didn't necessarily see him as a politician. He was our dad. And I see my sisters and uh, brothers here tonight. Can I just ask you all to just stand up and be acknowledged? Please, uh, Makofi, <laughs> Bob, Susan, and Rachel, and Bob's wife, Fiona. Okay, um, so I'm going to stick to five minutes, if, uh, if I can. Uh, so I didn't, I, and I speak for me personally, I, when I think about uh, my father, our father, I don't think about him as a politician. Really, to me, he was first and foremost a scientist. That's, uh, if you read this book, uh, I think that is something that will come through. Daddy had a curious mind. He had an investigative mind. And he was thorough. He was thorough in everything that he did. And that, those are the qualities of a good scientist. So first and foremost, to me and perhaps to others of my siblings, our dad was a scientist who became a politician. I don't know what a scientific politician looks like, but, <laughs> you know, he, he, first and foremost, he was a man of learning. He loved knowledge, he loved acquiring knowledge, and he loved sharing knowledge. So first and foremost, a scientist. And uh, this came through, um, it came through, and he, he, through his scientific approach and, and a view of life, he taught me a couple of things that I would like to share with uh, this gathering. Camellia sinensis. Another word for? Tea. Another word for tea. Uh, now, believe it or not, Odongo Omamo could identify every other his children are here with you. He could identify every plant. Actually, no, every seedling, every, every tree or bush, not perhaps not the grasses, but every tree or bush by the English name, the Latin name, and if it was indigenous to Lua land, the Lua name. It was an amazing ability. And if it so happened, if it so happened that you pointed to a tree and he didn't know what it was, the next time you asked, you, you would know. He would know. Daddy is somebody who believed that knowledge was something that you did and you acquired every day. Little by little. Little by little. In other words, he never stopped learning. He continued with his learning until his dying day. So he was a knowledgeable man, but he had that discipline. And knowledgeable men and women have this discipline in them. They seek to learn a little every day. And so to me, he uh, encouraged me to be an expert in something. You know, he began this learning process of the trees and whatever when he became a minister for environment he didn't learn it in school at Edgerton or anywhere he learned this as a grown man a government minister who decided that you know what I'm going to learn I'm the minister of environment I'm going to learn my environment so he had the attitude of learning the attitude of learning 
comes with humility. You need to say to yourself every day, I don't know, let me learn. So that was the one thing. The second thing, okay, uh, this is something that uh, I think all of us children can attest to, that being in a car with daddy was always an adventure. It wasn't an adventure because of the way he drove or was being driven. It was an adventure because he would point things out to you as you were on the road, you know. Not many children uh, have, that, have this privilege. Uh, many children don't have fathers and many children don't have fathers who have cars. We had both and we were really enjoyed ourselves when we were riding. Who here knows the altitude above sea level of Voy, the town of Voy? Can anybody take an educated guess of the altitude of Voy town? 1,900 feet. I'll never forget it. Because as we were driving past Voy town, daddy would say, we are now 1,900 feet above sea level. He taught me Really, that one lesson, he taught me to get interested in the things around you. The things that others take for granted. Be interested. That's a scientific mind. Be interested in the things you see around you. And uh, that's something that I'm still working on. That's something we're all still working on. To have an interest in Perhaps common things, things that other people don't think about. And the third and last thing, and I think I'm still within those five minutes, is uh, another quality of his. Who can tell me the fifth book of the Bible? The fifth book of the Bible. Anybody? Deuteronomy. Thank you. So, uh, dad was a man of rules. He wasn't a rebel. He wasn't a rebel uh, on a personal level. He wasn't a rebel on a political level. Those who know him know that daddy played by the rules. It would never occur to him to rig an election. I mean, who would? why would you want to do such a thing? It may seem trivial now, but there are many who, many politicians whose first, <laughs> whose primary, whose point of departure is, how am I going to rig this election? It would never occur to him to cheat on an exam. I'm told that there are people who cheat on exams and rig elections. But uh, we'll leave that to another day. So, I think that... Um, those are the three things that uh, daddy taught us and I'm, I think uh, some other of my siblings. The first thing was to be curious. The second thing was to follow the rules. And the third thing was to be an expert where you can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much, Thomas. I'd like to invite Bob, as I've known him. Sometimes I forget his, uh, his John Robert and Awa Omamo and all those other things. I just call him Bob. Uh, to Now, you see what Kaliyach means? I don't know whether to restrict him to five minutes. <laughs> uh, we have a saying, when a strong man uh, breaks your mother's pipe, the tobacco pipe, you don't blame your mother. You, no, you don't blame the, the intruder. You blame the mother. Mama, how can you be this careless? Putting your pipe where you know Mr. So-and-so is going to pass. 
This, this kind of indiscipline is not allowed. So I will blame myself. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Ken. Uh, good evening, everyone. As you've heard, um, my name is Bob. Uh, the official name is John Robert Angawa Omamo. Uh, and it's good to have all of you here today as we celebrate uh, our father, Dr. William Odongo Omamo. Um, I don't intend to talk much, but I wanted to share the journey that this book has traveled so that you could know uh, the challenges that it's gone through to get it where it is today. So our father started writing this book in 1988 after the Mulolongo election, the infamous election of 88. Uh, he had been rigged out in that particular election. Uh, Tom talked about rigging and dad was a victim of that back then. And it inspired him to start penning his memoirs. So he went through this intermittently for about 20 years till uh, 2008. And uh, you could say this book has actually traveled the journey of 34 years because 1988 up until now is 22 years. Along the way, uh, we lost Muse. And I actually feel we should start by maybe standing and give him a moment of silence in his honor. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so when we lost dad in 2010, uh, some of us, and at this time I'll speak for myself, uh, growing up, I had had the privilege of every now and then <clears throat> having a look at the manuscript. You know, I was a curious child. Just like Tom mentioned, we were taught to be curious. I was one of those very curious children growing up. So over the years, I would read the book here and there, the manuscript here and there, but it was boring then to me as a young person. But then I, I used to wonder that dad, he was living a very interesting life uh, back then when he was growing up. So in 2010, uh, we discussed as family to try and see how to release his manuscript, which was not complete, but then our dad as well had left a very big family. We are 16 children uh, across different generations. We could even say five generations because our oldest sister is born in 1948. So that makes us 74 right now. And our youngest, my brother Andrew, is born in 1986. So you can imagine how you're going to get a 74-year-old to agree with someone in his 30s right now. It wasn't so easy. But then uh, years went by, and then in 2019, actually 2017, I picked up the manuscript and read it again. And this time, I felt like the book was speaking to me at that particular moment. Uh, the book was asking me to, to, you know, asking me why it's not out. And so, I thought to myself that, you know, how could I go ahead with the project? Of course, I procrastinated, as Mweshimu uh, Alesirma was saying, procrastination. I really procrastinated. And then in 2019, uh, Kenya lost uh, one of the career uh, civil servants, uh, Mr. Kereini, and there's a friend who challenged me then. I, I don't know if he's here. John Marrow, are you here? Ah, yes. Thank you very much. John Marrow is actually the inspiration to me on how to release this book. He, I, I shared a picture of the raw manuscript to me, to him. 
and he asked me why that book wasn't out. And I, I joked to him that I would release it by his by dad's 10th anniversary in 2020, which was, which was uh, one year away from 2019. But then when 2020 came, I hadn't even started. <laughs> but then fortunately or unfortunately, COVID had hit the world. And so in April of 2020, I started sharing a few of dad's stories in his honor on Facebook. So I did seven days, a seven day tribute to him. And in the seven day tribute, I shared stories from uh, the manuscript and some were personal stories that I, I had with my dad. And there was so much, uh, that you could say it was a overwhelming response from friends and family on Facebook. And the, the main thing they kept on saying is that, you know what, you need to write a book on your dad. But what they didn't know is that there was actually a manuscript that just needed to be completed. So I took up the challenge. I realized that uh, Kenya and the world at large uh, was still interested in his story, even though it was 10 years after his death. So along the way, I got a writer to help me in this. We worked through 2020. In 2021, uh, we took a break because there's a point in which we were not really uh, getting along on the style of the book. And uh, that's when I decided to go on a quiet journey on looking for someone to help me with this book. And uh, as engineer Isaac Mutemi mentioned, when I got to meet him, he didn't know that I had an assignment for him because I had met him in a WhatsApp group of uh, alumni of the Alliance High School. So as you can see from how he spoke here, he's someone who's into detail, he's, he's that guy. Given the chance, Isaac could talk here all night, I can assure you. <laughs> from, you don't want to get into an argument with him uh, on WhatsApp. <laughs> so I realized this person who's into detail is the type of person I needed to work with in editing uh, the manuscript after working on it with the, with the writer. So we worked through it uh, from the beginning of this year up until about June. And then um, I engaged a few people to help me review. Uh, that's how I, I got engaged with Professor Pierre Lumumba. And I also engaged um, Kenneth Ayuko, who helped put a lot of things into perspective for me, Asante Sana. And then um, I could also say that the other people I have to thank who helped me along the way were well, my two mothers, uh, Mama Joyce, uh, who is our uh, elder mama in the home, who lived longest with our father for over 60 years. She really, really helped in filling in gaps for me as I moved along. My late mom, who passed on uh, two months ago, also helped me, especially with the political angle of, of things. Mom loved politics and, I mean, she was a true wife of a politician. And so she really helped me in piecing in a lot of gaps. So here we are today. Today is all about um, Ze, uh, the legacy he left behind, which we would like to continue growing because the book speaks a lot to a lot of issues that are relevant to Kenya. You can imagine 34 years later, a lot of the things he talks about are very relevant right now and to the future. So I also want to thank USIU as I conclude. Um, USIU, it's not by accident that we're in USIU today. Uh, apart from I studying here many years ago, Tom was the first of our family members to come through here. And our father actually had three of his children through the university. And three grandchildren have also come through this university. So it's a legacy in its own. I joked to the chairman of the Alumni Association when we were hoggling over if I should pay something or not pay for the hall. And I told him, I challenge you to tell me someone which man has a bigger legacy than our father in this university. And I'm still waiting for the answer. <laughs> so uh, in that regard, uh, when, when, when I'm done later on in the program, I would also like to donate 
six books to the university library uh, symbolically uh, to cover the six uh, descendants of Mze that went through this university. I thank you very much. Where is the band? Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm told telepathically that I've been incorporated in that band. I could tell from the smile I got when I did that rendition of Malaika. Uh, as we get again a short interlude. Naomba mtoto wa kijinsia ya binti pia aseme machache moja mbili tu so that we give a, a, a balance with an agenda. No, agenda balance. May I, any volunteer? Yes, 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 yes. I, I hope I'm not sounding too much like a tuoli. He goes, yes. Good evening, everyone. This has really caught me off guard. My name is Rachel Omamo, and uh, I am Zez 11th born. We are a large family. It is really hard to come up and say something after Tom and Bob spoke, because they were prepared. And uh, as they spoke, it really took me back. It has made me reminisce quite a bit about the good old days. Um, Tom said that the journeys with dad were very interesting because he always pointed out things. For me, it wasn't like that. For me, they were very tense because he would be asking, so what is that? How can you not know that this is Ndori? How can you not know that? What kind of clouds are those? How can you not know their nimbus? <laughs> so for me, there were very uh, tense moments at times. But something that um, he also made us do, as he knew all the plants, we had to recite them. At times, he had to make, we, we had to write a list of the various plants we had in our compound. And uh, for those who have come to our home in Capio, you know that the compound is very large. To write the name of every single flower, every single tree. But I do remember as a child, when visitors would come and hear us singing the botanical names of those various flowers, you know, we sounded like small, like young geniuses. So those are some of my fond uh, memories uh, of dad. He had this briefcase, Bob didn't mention it. There was this brown briefcase. Um, I think there were phases where each of us got a turn to carry. I remember there was a point in time when I was the one who had that duty of getting the briefcase. In fact, there were two. There was one that was just filled with drugs. Any kind of medication you needed <laughs> was in one suitcase. And the other one had his material uh, for work. And uh, later on, Bob also got that duty. And as much as I didn't like it, at that time, it was actually a bonding session. He'd make you go and get his briefcase. He'd open it up and then make you read a thing or two of an, uh, 
be it a paper or a part of the manuscript, manuscript, you'd read it to him. Yeah. So it is quite an honor um, to have all of you come and share this special moment with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daktari. Uh, actually, I think I speak on behalf of all of us when, when I say the honor is actually ours for being allowed by this very generous family to share uh, in these very intimate moments. <coughs> Kolo kolola, mama kolola kolola. Kolo kolola, mama kolola kolola. Embe dodo, embe dodo. Limela alam changani. Embe dodo, embe dodo. Limela alam changani. Kwaoba na mazoea. Oh, we want to amelele, baby, kwao ba na mazoea. Oh, we want to amelele. Kolo kolo na, mama kolo la kolo na. Kolo kolo na, mama kolo la kolo na. Emedo do, emedo do, imela alam changani. have it back then. <laughs> Dr. Barak Muluka is not a stranger to political, literary, and uh, sometimes economic commentary. And uh, while putting up this, uh, this auspicious gathering, Bob had a wonderful idea of having a double keynote. That's the note that opens the door. Key and note. Or opens the chest where the treasure is kept. And I'm sure in his sojourn through life, just like me, he encountered this man. Dr. Barak Muluka, I humbly, with your permission, I'm going to go oxymoron again, request. Of course, if he has given permission, the request has been granted to come and give us your wise words about 
this man. Who my mouth doesn't have the capacity to mention his name. Ero, come on. Huh? Thank you. Basi <laughs> asante uh, sana. Let me begin by acknowledging the Omamo family. Uh, before I acknowledge my brother, Professor Pielo Lumumba, and acknowledge all of you for this evening. We gather here this evening to remember and celebrate one of the most notable actors on the Kenyan national stage. And some of us have been privileged not just to read about him in this book, which I commend highly to everyone who wants to read a good story well told by a great man who did great things. But also having had the opportunity to have been on part of the national landscape that uh, he talks about, and having had the opportunity to enjoy the privilege of witnessing some of the things that are rendered in the story. Certainly things that are told of beginning anywhere in the mid-60s, I would remember some perhaps not in granular detail, uh, maybe because I was also in the formative years. Some also because I was not on the scene where they were happening in the theater where the drama took place. But the memories are conjured up nonetheless. So thank you very much, uh, the Omamo family. Thank you, Bob. I usually call you Robert, and then you remind me I'm Bob. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, uh, Bob, and uh, through you, the rest of the family, for the opportunity to come here and just uh, share some thoughts, some reflections on your late dad and some reflections on the book uh, that uh, you have eventually done the noble thing by making it uh, happen and congratulations. And thank you for inviting me alongside my brother, Pielo Lumumba. I usually say the inimitable Pielo Lumumba uh, because uh, uh, his uh, felicity of uh, diction and celerity of mind is incomparable. And therefore, it's not quite correct to say that uh, you are going to have uh, a double keynote. I only do a John the Baptist kind of assignment because uh, the real uh, keynote will come after me. In the ancient Greek times, uh, Professor, I've told you this before, I would do a Cicero job and you do a Demosthenes job. They say that when Cicero had spoken, the people said, a great speech, how well he spoke. But after Demosthenes had spoken, the people said, let us march. Let us march for justice. Let us march for freedom. Let us march for what is right. And that's what he will be doing later on. I have had the opportunity to interact with the book uh, closely. And the first thing, of course, was to wonder about why the path to Kaliech. I was saying to my friend who accompanied me here that by the time I rise uh, up to speak, I'm going to have figured it out. And I think I've got it. The Path to Kaliech. This book is about greatness. It's about a great man seeking to do great things. 
And he tells us in the book that he propels on the gravity of uh, his own passion, his own momentum, his own energy. It's something which his colleagues told him at some point when he attended a uh, uh, senior manager's training workshop somewhere in Arusha, and he was experiencing some challenges back home in his place of work. And they told him, you know what? You travel on your own energy in his pursuit of great things, not just for himself, but for others as well. But he was also a big man in body, a big man in mind. And therefore, when we look at Kaliech, and I've seen the elephant somewhere, that one who looks like or who reminds us of the leper, the, 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 uh, the elephant, the king of the jungle, the great man, we think about the path to greatness. So if I were to paraphrase and offer an alternative title, I would say it was the path to greatness, the pursuit of greatness. And to appreciate that greatness, even as captured and rendered in this book, you've got to appreciate a bit of the Luo cosmology, the Luo world. The Luo people are people who are eternally in love with greatness. They like doing things in a great way. In fact, it has been said of the Luo people that to be Luo is an attitude. It's an attitude of greatness, an attitude of liking and doing the finer things of life. When you read uh, Gideon, Saulo, Were, and Derek Wilson talking about the Luo migrations into what they call the interlacustrine region, or as we call it these days, the Great Lakes region, when uh, Ken was in high school, it was called the interlacustrine region. They tell you that um, one of the first impacts of the arrival of the Luo people in the Great Lakes region from the Bar El Gazelle region of uh, South Sudan was that they arrived uh, with a, a very sophisticated material culture. And we see that culture in transformation in different guises today. But that material culture also derives from uh, a certain philosophical culture. The first few chapters of this book open you up to that cosmology, to that world, the world of values, the world of uh, education that people had at that time before uh, Omamo went to Maranda Elementary School and subsequently to Ma the Maseno School, he already interacted with his people, with his community, and there was a lot of learning that you see within that world. It is uh, an education that helps you to even keep your genealogical history and lifeline up to where we are. I have seen that uh, through 17 generations, he traces himself back to the great Ramogi Ajuang. Somewhere along the lines, uh, Professor PLO, my name, given name is also mentioned, uh, Okwaro. And so we will be sitting down later on to find out exactly what happened, uh, where we seem to have lost one another, uh, because it does appear that uh, I am of uh, this family. And of course, uh, Mutemi, uh, yes, it was Mutemi, Isaac. Uh, he accuses us of uh, being uh, dynastic, 
and uh, almost begrudges us of uh, the privilege of uh, education. Uh, as one of uh, those who interacted with the book, he knows that uh, it was not always very easy. The people had to walk long distances, sometimes as many as 21 kilometers in pursuit of that education. And there is sufficient proof that that education was sought and that education was found and that education was had. We have seen sometimes people saying that they went to such and such a school. And our people say that uh, when you have been a, a hunter and you tell people that you are a hunter, you must be able to say which forest you hunted in and which part of that forest you hunted in and who your fellow hunters were. We have seen that uh, in the narrative about the Maseno school, Odongo Omamo gives a very clear picture of the people who are there. You know, in these days of certificates particularly, it's very important to say who saw you in school. And these days, instead of people saying who saw them in school, they rush to court. They look for Professor PLO. They say, go to court. Tell them I don't want them to continue investigating my education. And uh, Odongo Mamo is very clear about the people who saw him in Maranda School, uh, the people who saw him in Maseno School. I don't want to say uh, who was not seen in which school. But I want to say that uh, Odongo Mamo was seen in the Maranda School, and he was seen in Maseno School, and he was seen in Punjab University. He gives the names of the people who are there with him. And later on, when he went to Pakistan, he gives the names of the people who are there. When he went to Oregon, he gives the names of the people who are there. But he does not just drop names. He's not a name dropper. He also goes into great detail of telling you about the studies that he undertook. He gives you descriptions of uh, his courses in agricultural economics in uh, Punjabu. He talks in great detail about uh, what he did in Oregon, what he did in Pakistan. And when he comes back home, he gives you the application of those studies in Embu, in Nyanza, in Egerton, and you can say, yes, this is a true scholar. This is a, a person who actually interacted with education. He was a true hunter, gatherer in the forest of modern education as we know it. But when you read this book, you will also see him hunting back in Sakwa with the villagers, with clubs, clubbing even water bags, and helping to share the meat and distribute it to his fellow villagers. He's an amazing character who was able to fit everywhere. He would fit very snugly in the village and fit very snugly in the academy and fit very snugly in government. I have had the privilege of uh, being a publishing editor and also the privilege of being approached by people uh, quite often who would like to tell their stories. And you will sit with them for a month, two months, and you are saying, but where is the story? The story is not happening. You are saying fairly humdrum, mundane things that do not start giving us a story that we want to read. In fact, many times when people talk about uh, their stories, they are kind of uh, hagiographies. You would kind of think that uh, they were saints, that they never made mistakes. But here is a, a person who introspects, and when he thinks that he got it wrong, when he thinks that there was an opportunity to laugh at himself, he laughs at himself, a very honest person.
But uh, one of the more revealing things about uh, this biography is the political journey of uh, Dr. William Odongo Mamo, and which many people have not understood. William Odongo Mamo decided that he would go into politics, so he wanted to go into politics in 1968. After he had given a talk in Kisumu to Luo students, there used to be something that uh, we called the Luo Students League. I found it at the University of Nairobi in the 1970s when uh, I was an undergrad. I don't know, it disappeared. I think uh, President Moi in 1981 decided that he was banning all um, tribal associations in the country. And I think that league was one of those casualties. But it was at uh, that time that he thought he would join politics. However, he could not uh, share that information with uh, his wife, with uh, Mama Joyce, uh, first because she was going to have a baby, uh, the baby Manajua Nenani, uh, of family when you get back home. He was going to have a baby. But uh, he went on nonetheless to walk through the motions. Then 1969, when he was in his element, his good friend Tom Boyer was cut down by an assassin's bullet in Midtown, Nairobi, in broad daylight. And uh, that was uh, something of a major backsetter. It was also a very interesting year, 1969, because in January of the same year, Agwing's uh, codex CMG uh, died along the road that is in this city named for him in a car accident in January. In July, on the 5th, Tom Boyer stopped an assassin's bullet. And on the 25th of uh, October, there were chaos in Kisumu. The following day, Jaramugi Oginga Odinga was detained. Within the space of less than 10 months, three eminent Luo politicians had quit the political space. And I doubt that that space has ever been occupied again in the same manner since that year. I doubt because my own political consciousness was awakened on that Saturday, the fifth day of July, 1969. I was playing with marbles with my fellow kids in Jericho. And Mze he understands Lugua Tunacheza Bano Banta no trizet jaribu mchezo. When you say mchezo una chapa. Na una chapa unazipanga vizuri unaeka kama sita hivi and you caution the fellows, you tell them double dabos na mambe le had to leave. Yeah? That means anything you hit in the process, when the last one gets into the hall, uh, you take all of them. And I was just uh, having that double doubles na mambele had to leave moment when my mother's sister came running, saying, mse, mse, le, le, let's go to the house. People are fighting in town. Uh, another umwami has been killed. Only later on to learn it was uh, Tom Boyer and the assassin lived a few houses away from us in uh, Jericho. And we have followed the history of this country very closely since that time up to where we are. And within that context, I'll keep the rest of uh, my remarks fairly brief so that I don't hog everything for Desmotenes, Jananga. <laughs> who will come <laughs> to do the real thing. Um, the search for greatness 
it tells you that uh, Odongo Omamo belongs to what, if you are pessimistic, you could say a missed opportunity. If you are optimistic, you would say he was a man ahead of his times and he represents the future, what the country is still waiting for. That the path to power, the path to greatness is not just about panegyrics. And he had quite a few of his own. When you, you look at... Um, a certain place here where he calls himself, I think it's Odeglo, Odeglo, Rapindi, Arudi, Kaliech, Kurikuri. Somewhere inside you'll find he's calling himself Debo. And when he's hunting, he has got another panegyric. When he kicks the ball, there's a moment when he kicks the ball just once. It goes in the air, and when it gets back down, it is torn, and the game has ended. When he is looking for greatness, he's always in a team of people. He's always negotiating with people and seeking a second opinion before he makes his decision. He's always pursuing the path of dialogue with others. And he's always standing up for what he considers to be just. You see, when you have not understood who Odongo Mamu was as a politician, you'd actually think that uh, he was the foil to the Odingas. You'd actually think that um, he was their nemesis, that he was uh, kind of their adversary. But to the contrary, you will find that... Uh, the relationship was quite close. From quite early on, he acknowledges that uh, he's going to India, the path to India, as the path to this greatness was paved for him by Jaramogi Oginga Odinga. And we see quite a, a selfless Jaramogi who is also trying to grow his nation, his people. Towards the end of the narrative, that story comes back when um, Odongo Mamu is uh, given a honoris causa by an Indian university. And because he recognizes and acknowledges the role of uh, Jaramogi Ogingo Dinga in his growth, he is victimized. There are people who say that, oh, he's now gone to the opposition and now we must uh, sort him out. And in the subsequent Q voting election of 1988, they sort him out, more or less bringing the curtain down. I'd also like to uh, observe that uh, Kaliech uh, Odongo Mamo while interacting in the political space, is a conscientious objector. He follows his conscience and sets out to do what he thinks is right without confrontation. Yes, Tom was here. And Tom, I'm very happy to meet you. Where are you again? Yeah, I'm very happy to meet you. When I was reading the book, I got worried about uh, that point where you were happening and getting into this world. And the moment Tom had to, Tom had to spend time in the incubator and the father was referring to him as a very little baby. And I was very worried because the mother's placenta ruptured uh, completely. And so I got very worried and Tom, I'm happy that you are here, you're not as little as, <laughs> as Mze thought, but then he was Kaliech, so we must know where he was looking at it from. Maybe expected you 
would be like my brother and, and friend uh, Bob uh, here. So I'm very happy about, uh, about that. In 1981, in April, Yaramogi Oginga Odinga was supposed to run for parliament. And I was uh, a second year student at the University of Nairobi. And uh, when Kanu barred Jaramogi Oginga Odinga from running, we protested. I was one of those who protested. Of course, we didn't have the complete story. When you read here, now you will know what exactly happened. And Jaramogi, of course, had been barred from 1974. He tried to run. Uh, he didn't manage. They said, oh, it is Omamu. It is Omamu who has uh, now uh, put hurdles in his way. And so he threw his, way, his weight behind Ogo, Josiah Ogo. In 1979, uh, again, I was a first-year student at the University of Nairobi. When we woke up one morning, we read the headline at the Central Catering Unit as we are going for breakfast. Anyona and XKPU bad. And we burst into the streets saying that uh, they should run, but they didn't. They were not allowed. The following year, President Moy began rehabilitating Yaramogi. But Yaramogi went to Mombasa, and while he was there, he said some things about Jomo Kenyatta, which some people among them, Attorney General Charles Njonjo, did not like, because he said, oh, Kenyatta was a land grabber, but Moy is a good man. He told me, come, Baba, let us work together and build Kenya. And so they said, how can he say the president called him Baba? And they barred him. In the process, uh, Ugo, of course, had just resigned to allow him to run. The contestants became Odongo Omamo and uh, somebody else whose name escapes me for the time being. Yeah? Ah, Jalango, yes. But Jalango did not manage to pull the numbers that he required to be nominated to compete for the Kanu primaries. So when um, Omamo, and, and I, I shortened the story because there was a bit of uh, uh, bull stuff with the returning officer and Odongo Omamo went to court and the court declared that Yalango had not been validly nominated. And so Odongo Mamu was declared the MP unopposed. And we burst into the streets to protest because we did not know. So on behalf of that generation of students, um, Ze, and you are student leaders subsequent to that, I would like to apologize to Odongo Mamu and the family for that impression and everything else bad that uh, we did. Otherwise, thank you very much for this opportunity and congratulations. And now Jananga himself, uh, Demosthenes, will uh, shortly come over. Let me follow the correct path so that he can come and uh, speak to us. I thank you very much. It has been said before. No, that's too pedestrian. These days you go, a story is told. Yeah, a story is told of how before a great man <coughs> uh, gets onto the stage, you have to welcome them with, how many understand the word gara? There are jingles usually at the 
How many understand uh, Orutu? Orutu is a violin. How many understand a dunglu? Yatiti. They are not new. That's the harp. It's a harp. The Muzungu calls it a harp. And so on and so forth. That before that happens, there has to be a, a combination of that. Give me your best. I'm not old, as I told Bona Mashimewa. You don't use the word old and me in the same sentence. I can only mature. And with each year of maturity, I get better like wine. Some of those momentous occasions, like 5th of July, I was 150 meters from where Mboya was shot. A young, outgoing student of Upper Hill coming from a sports day meeting on Friday at Isili High School and going back to where I stayed in Kibera. Mix of both worlds. When Jeremogi talked about the grabber, I was at Tononoka grounds. Ad infinitum. So it is good to feel part of the process. And when you, like he says, when you read this book, you get the gist of the misconceptions. And sometimes you ask yourself, for whose benefit? And that is probably a question each of us needs to answer. He does need an introduction. And so I'm not going to try to give one. Because we know he has talked to statesmen. To bishops. And the common man. He has talked across the board to everybody. He has been the continental conscience of Africa. And probably the world. Telling us where what we are doing, no, what we might not be doing right. As a human being, he's also not very definitive of what is wrong, but he knows what we might not be doing right. And probably if we tinkled it here and there, if we tweaked it and changed this and did that, we might just get it right. It is a tall order. And uh, without being anything other than respectful. We have a saying, tin tin ok mi decre. Loosely translated into English, small small is not mediocre. 
For those who didn't know, mediocre means mediocre. <laughs> PLO, prof, lawyer, teacher, professor. You are a parent to father. I yield. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let, let me start at the very outset to acknowledge the family of the late Dr. William Odongo Mamo and also acknowledge my very good friend who is present with me to render the other keynote address which he has done on the occasion of the launch of this book written posthumously in honor of Dr. Odongo Mamo. Let me also acknowledge Mze Lesirma, whom I've known for many years and who has had the opportunity of serving this nation in various capacities and who in his brief remarks reminded us of his interaction with the late Omamo. Let me also acknowledge those who have taken time to be present with us this evening. And I particularly want to acknowledge Bob because what he has done jointly with the family is something that very few have done in this country. He undertook a task of ensuring that the life and times of William Odongo Mamo is immortalized. When he sent the manuscript to me very early on to read through, I was delighted because I could relate with quite a number of things which now find themselves in the book. I could relate with them because as I told him and unknown to him, what is recorded in pages 105 to 106 is something that has been, had been narrated to me by my father times without number. That is how Dr. Omamo met Joyce Achola. I told to him he did not know that Joyce Achola and my father are first cousins and that in fact their eldest sister Tabitha Alo is, was named for my grandmother Alo because Alo and Chama were uh, the daughters of Omolo and my father is Omolo named for the grandfather. He was pleasantly surprised or so I assumed. I also reminded him that quite a number of the stories that are rendered in the book are familiar to me and that I remember what is now recorded in the final copy at pages 255, how his mother joined the family. And I could remember, and that is not included, I remember very early on, in 1972, I was a, a student at Usenge Primary School. And your mother, Anne, was also a student several years ahead of me and was an accomplished netball player. And I remember in 1972, your father, Odongo Omamo, was a visitor at Usenge Primary School. And I can remember that the students were gathered under the big tree that he mentions in that book, Tamarindas Indicus, the Chua tree, 
And I can remember that your mother was one of the students who was being awarded on that day for her performance in netball. And I can now begin to imagine that perhaps it is on that day that his eyes started wandering. But of course, that is not told in that story. In other words, it is a book and a story that I can relate to. And I was very glad and very humbled when he requested me to write the foreword, which is to be found in Roman pagination five and six of the book. And his own contribution and that of the family is also rendered in that book. And you will have occasion to read it in pages six through to Roman nine, in which he explains how that book came about and came alive. And I say in the forward that what has happened is a great thing. When you read the forward, my experience is that many people will buy the book and will never read it. But I urge you to read it. It is a story well told and of a great man. And it did not allow me to even hesitate when I thought about it to use the word Colossus to describe Odongo Mamo. He truly metaphorically and literally bestrode the Kenyan political scene like the fabled Colossus. And I did not hesitate when, as I say in my foreword, when I related his entry into the arena, both politically and otherwise, to the famous story that is told of Gaius Julius Caesar, when he very easily at the famous Battle of Zella achieved a battle within a day and he said, Vene vidi vici, I came, I saw, and I conquered. It can be said of Omamo that he came, he saw, and conquered many places. And the beauty of the story is that it is a, a fountain of knowledge. It tells the younger generation is that you must be rooted in what you do. And that is why he starts with his very foundation. Whose child was he? And in an era where ethnicity now rules the roost, he says that if you want to find the purity of Luo blood in him, you will not find it. Because he can trace his ancestry to the Gusi or the Awagusi of this nation. And he tells the story well. I urge you to read about Odongo Mamo and his uh, juvenile escapade in Sakwa, which neighbors my own rural home in Imbo. It has also not been said, but when you talk about oration in this country, he was one of the greatest orators that this country has ever produced. In fact, I dare say, those of you who had the occasion to listen to him speaking in the Luo language, he was a joy to listen to. I remember so very vividly when the politics of this country was still tame. And I'm suggesting to this audience that over the years our politics has degenerated because I can remember in 1979 during the campaigns when politicians were campaigning they held joint rallies. And you rose and spoke. And once you had spoken, then your opponent spoke. 
and you carried away your audience by force of reason. And Aruthi was capable of doing it. I remember being at a rally at Usenge Beach when his opponent was a man called Okelo Ndisi. And Okelo spoke first. That was his misfortune. And when he had spoken, he claimed that he was the tilapia which was being eaten by everybody. And on that ground alone, he should be elected. He said it in Luo. It's more beautiful in Luo. He said, pinje chuero. So when Omar rose, he said, No kelo kandisini. Okunge, do you know him? Was he not the man who was employed and was in charge of human resource? It was then called, it wasn't called human resource, he was a personnel manager. Then he said, this Okelo Kandisi who was in charge of human resource, who has he ever employed? Of course, he was exaggerating. And then he asked the audience, has he ever employed anybody? The audience said, no. Then he went on and said, no Kelo Kandisi ni engege pinje chuero. O se chuere imbo, o se chuere sakwa, o se chuere game, tindo rumo, o kelo rumo, koro ongegi mi chuero. He was telling them, and, and, and this is just a play on words. He was the quintessential orator. I'm happy that his oratorical skills are mentioned in the book. And when this generation and generations yet to be born read of this great man, it will be said of him that he was a great orator, but with content. Some of you may also not know that the name Kaliech, or the moniker by which we now know him as Kaliech, had many meanings. But I remember at one time, when he was lamenting, that was in 1988, when there were huge political rallies, and he was rigged, he then said that when the rallies are organized, the people, Biro Kaliech, they come like an elephant. But when they vote, it's like the rabbit. That was his ability to play with words. Intellectually agile. That was a great man. And history will remember him fondly. And I'm quite certain that if he is upstairs, he's looking on this occasion, and he's saying, behold, I left good children who have done a good thing to immortalize me. So the book talks about Odongo's heritage, but he also talks about his, the cosmology of his Lua peoples. And I want you to take time to read pages 27 through to 28. When he talks about the different peoples, the different artists, he calls it superstition. But those of who are younger, it takes you into a world that introduces you into what would be called Luo spirituality. Because later he talks about his Christian foundations, but he does not disconnect with the root. I urge you to read that. He talks about his education, and my good friend Dr. Barak Muluka has also mentioned that those who seek never fail to find. He sought at a time when he was going to school, and Nzele Sirma will tell you there are many who tried to go out of ten. Perhaps it is only two that succeeded. And indeed, when he mentions the few individuals, and I urge you to read that on page 122, when he mentioned the people in Maseno that were 
in his view, material for university education, this was only a very small and select group. He walked the path of greatness through the furnace of trials and tribulation. Because there are many great individuals out there, but greatness does not grow on trees. Greatness must be nurtured and watered by hard work. And that is the story that he is telling us. The spirit of never say die. He talks about the family, his family that he loved. And if there was one man that respected the divine instruction, go ye and fill the earth. It was a Ruthi. He did it. And he filled the earth with good men and women. I listened to Tom and I could see the elements of Kaliech as he spoke. He was wedded to his word. I listened to Bob. I could see a chip of the old block. I listened to Rachel. I know the one for whom you are named. We called her Ryle. But of course, as you got more anglicized, it became Rachel. And it's a chip of the old block. You have done your father proud. And the beauty of this book is that it humanizes Dr. Mamo. There is the tendency when books are written, and I've had the advantage of reading a few of the autobiographies or biographies written. And I've said it in my foreword, they are hagiographical. They present the character as if they were not without any blemish. In Kaliech, we see the frailties of a human being. And out of those frailties, we see the rise of a great man, whom, as I've said, and allow me to repeat, bestrode this country like a colossus. He's told us about his journey. He's not afraid to mention the persons who assisted him in his rise. In other words, as you climb, you lift and you are lifted. There is a basketball player, and I was surprised that basketball players in the United States can make such wise statement, but he did. Dikembe Mutombo of the Democratic Republic of Congo said rightly that when you use the elevator to go up, send the elevator down so that it can carry others. The testimony that we have heard from Zele Sirma, the testimony that we have heard is that he also lifted others. My memory still serves me well. I first personally interacted properly with Dr. Omamo in 1978. I was a Form 4 student, believing that I could change the world and I could start from the village. He was then, I believe, a member of parliament. And I remember I had founded an organization, the West Yimbo Youth Organization. My cousin here, will remember. And I invited him courageously to be the guest of honor in that Arambe in Usenge. And he did arrive. And I remember that we raised 50,000 Kenya shillings in 1974. And I remember that we bought a parcel of land which is there up till now. I then interacted with him in 1981 when he was the Minister of Agriculture. And this is how I think 
I then started interacting with him a lot more intimately. We went there as Bondo Students Association. We were young at the university and thought we could change the world. As I've already said, we sat in his office at the reception and we were served with tea and, 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 and other writings which we consumed ravenously. As we were leaving, He tried to give us each 500 shillings and we refused. He was shocked. We were university students, but we said, no, we don't want money. We want you to be our patron. And he agreed to be our patron. I'm telling you all these stories to underline the fact that in the book you also see his humility. And humility is the mother's milk of greatness. Tom talked about it, that when you are humble, the more you know, the more you know you do not know. When you meet any individual who claims that he is learned and he is arrogant, that is a fool. Because it is only foolishness that makes anybody believe that they know everything. And you will see that in the book. His appetite, his large appetite for knowledge. And I'll tell you a story which is not in the book. You know, Dongo is called Wenya Imbo because the mother is from Imbo. And uh, where is uh, one of uh, my cousins here? Yeah, but I'll, I'll tell the story. There was a time when he came for a political rally and the people of Imbo thought that his words were a little uncharitable. So they put together a delegation of five individuals to go to his farm in Sakwa, in Kapio, to make representation that they were unhappy with him. That was in 1982, and uh, there had been an attempted coup, and uh, we were at home for about one year. And I happened to be in that meeting taking the minutes for the old men. And we then, I was asked and detailed to accompany the men to Kapio. And when we arrived, he did not appear. But the individuals who were sent were served with all manner of good food and all manner of drinks. When he arrived, he overwhelmed them and the message was not delivered. <laughs> so as we were going back, they started blaming each other. What are we going to say back at home? And he taught me one thing. When you are a leader, when people visit you, don't meet them before they have eaten. It is one of the ways of disarming them. Because once they have eaten their food, once they have eaten your food, they will not contradict you. I think many Kenyan politicians, including Mzele Sirma, don't know that trick. So one can go on and on, but this is a great occasion. We are gathered here to remember a great man, we are gathered here because that great man has been immortalized in the written word. We are gathered here because that great man lived our life that is worth immortalizing. We are gathered here because that great man had children who have had the wisdom and the courage and the determination to ensure that his work is midwifed into what it is now. We are here today, several years after his departure from this earth, to say of him that he was a great man. In this world, there are many who come, and their greatest claim to fame is that they were born and that they died. In between, the birth and death, there is nothing unremarkable. We are here, therefore, to remind ourselves that in this life, 
that recognizes and acknowledges and acknowledges certificates, let it not be said of you that the only certificates you acquired in your life were the birth certificate for which you did not work, or the baptismal certificate for which you may not have worked, and the death certificate which will be issued after you are gone. In between, there are many certificates to be earned. And those certificates come in different forms. They come through the lives that you touched. Kaliyach came. He was known by different names. He was called Aruthi. He was named after a person called Aruthi. Those who know the Luo language, when you are called a Ruthi, it can mean many things, but the meanings notwithstanding, it only points in one direction, that you are a man who cannot be taken for granted. If you want to claim that it is an English word, you can claim it is a synonym of ruthless, but that is untrue. But it's explained the same thing. He was called Kaliech because he lived his life with a big spoon. And he lived it. But I want to conclude with this. The first time that I ever saw a motor vehicle that rises and goes down was when Odongo Mamo came to Senge with uh, Citroen. How many of you saw the old Citroen, which we call Citron? That car, and some of you may have uh, been driven it. Tom, were you there when it was there? When you get into it, don't confuse it with the Pro Box. It was a different ball game. It rises. And those who were energized said, one day I want to drive this. Odongo Mamo inspired many people in different ways. As a farmer, those of you who have had the advantage of visiting his farm, you'll see what he has done. And he did it at a time when very few people believed that it could be done. He says in his book that when he grew up, he did not know that Sakwa was in the rain shadow. And it is. But that notwithstanding, he did what had to be done. Today, when I travel across Nyanza, go to any school that is worthy of attention, you'll find a foundation stone laid by William Odongo Omamo particularly when he was the Minister for Natural Resources. You who are here, as I conclude, must now ask yourselves, young and old, when you are dead, dead and gone, what will be said of you? Will it be said of you like Kaliech that you came, you saw, and conquered? Will it be said of you when you pass, as is said of great men in, in West Africa, that the great Iroko tree has fallen? Will it be said of you that you left a mark in the lives of men? This is an occasion to introspect. Today, we are here because William Odongo Mamo is dead. Long live William Odongo Omamo Kaliech. God bless him wherever he is, and God bless all of us who are here to memorialize him and to immortalize him. Once again, Robert, you've done a good thing. The Omamo family, you've done a good thing. In many families in this country, when a patriarch departs, 
what we hear is scramble for material wealth of the Omamu family we have not heard. What we hear, which is a testament to a good patriarch, is that he left unfinished business and we have finished it. May God bless you. Thank you. A December applause, not a January. Yeah, that's more like it. <coughs> Before we do the official launch, like uh, all literary people will tell you, we do an epilogue. And this epilogue is my ad lib. It's going to be very short, but it's a time for reflection, as we have been, we have been uh, urged to do. What happens in this reflection? And my reflection is this. In 2010, early February, the great William Odongo Omamo was transported back home to his resting place. And since I've been reading the manuscript, the raw manuscript, the first print, the second print, a few things go through my mind about what happened or what should have happened on that day. And I can't help but visualize the plane carrying the great Udongo Mamo, flying over the Nandi Hills. And he takes a look down and he sees the sugarcane plantations of Chemelin and Mohoroni. And further afield, he sees the rice paddies with the water simmering, and uh, especially when you're passing through at mid morning. And I imagine the nostalgia with which Kaliyaj is looking at this, looking at the successes and the failures of commercial agriculture in Kenya, looking at the mismanagement of the sugar factories, and looking at how the farming community has been impoverished by that, and wishing that he was there to do something about it. Then the plane lands, and the cottage leaves the airport as it winds its way to Sakwa, passes by the molasses plant and Utonglo market and to Kisian. And it goes beyond Kisian. We go through the small hill of Obambo as it goes to Pawakuche. And it notices the poor pasture that most of the ground is covered with what he has in the book, the Sodom apple or chalk and obenju, which in local folklore is uh, a good substitute for toilet tissue. But that, that is all there is. And spindly looking, very machined livestock. Cows that, as he used to say, when you milk, the milk hits the cup. Not like the great cow where the milk comes out. Brrr, brrr, brrr. He looks at the machetted goats and sheep. And he looks at the kids looking after them, tending uh, after them, and reminds himself of how it was in 1934. He sees the women hawking bananas around Kisian. Then he remembers that, unfortunately, most of this banana is not even localized. It has come from the hills of Kisi, and it has come from Western, and some of it has come from as far as Meru. That it's his efforts to transform this agriculture has not picked up as he would have liked it. But he also remembers, he goes through Yagokoluga, and he notices that the famous Yago is still there, 
is now looking much smaller because now he has grown bigger. And the area surrounding is covered, has been encroached by the farm. And the area under it has got a retinue of kiosks selling all manner of things that the locals might want. Then he looks across on the other side of the road and he still sees Kitmikai. And there's hope because nine years later, the governor, the efforts of the governor makes Kitmikai be declared a world heritage site. It is now time. Unfortunately, it isn't written here. And this occasion was a book launch. I think it is now time to do that. And I would like to invite Pielo, Barak, Bob, Meshimiwa, Tom, and Rachel. The family has to be here. I insist. Sometimes when you're a prefect, you give orders. Who's the, who is doing the giz? We do the cutting of the cake first, don't we? Yeah. Who is uh, operating the, the gizmo that is going to do, that's going to notify? Yeah. Huh? Or you're going to do it by remote? Oh. Now, let's. There it goes. Come on. I, I, need, I, need, I need a copy that as big as that. That's the Kalia kind of uh, edition. And uh, what do you say when this happens? You just keep quiet. <laughs> Come on, this is wonderful. Pass by and, and get the feel. Get the feel of the confetti. Eh? Get the feel of the confetti. Huh? Don't fear the book. When you fear the book, you fear to read. <laughs> oh boy, does this feel good? Don't you feel... When the fire when the fire dies down it means the baking has been done and before we leave uh, this uh, this region this uh, hallowed stage you will notice that there is also another dummy book here most of us think it is just a book no but that's decoration that is cake decoration. And uh, when we get to the cutting of the cake, Susan will do us the honors. You don't count people, but I think there are enough mouths or there is enough cake for the number of mouths we have here. So th thank you very much. Um, one thing that isn't mentioned in the book about my father is his love for cake. That he was actually a sweet tooth. By the time we were born, we didn't see him baking cakes, but we heard the stories from our elders that he used to get into the kitchen and bake cakes. Yeah. Luo men didn't do that in those days. <laughs> they did not. In fact, well, by the time we were born, I didn't see my father in the kitchen. But I understand he used to bake cakes. But what he did do, um, by the time I was in high school, for three years in a row, he held cake baking competitions. And he says he wants to 
select the best cake. And I remember this, uh, but it, it, I, I loved the competition. So I would bake so many cakes. Um, others will bake one each, and then cakes from um, um, Mama Joyce's house, cakes from Mama Anne's house will be put together, and my dad will go and taste each cake. What a wonderful way for a sweet tooth to satisfy himself. <laughs> so even as we cut this cake, um, I need help here. And we remember um, the great man who is William Odongo Mamo. I'm one of the people who took after him with that sweet tooth and took after him in size of body. And, you know, it, I'm humbled. And it's my pleasure to cut this cake um, as we launch the book. I don't know what else to say. Here we go. Aye. I want to believe it's his favorite, you know, whatever flavor it is, things have changed so much. Just before I give my the vote of thanks, I'd just like to narrate um, one encounter um, I had with uncle. My name is Victor Ogutu Omamo. My father is a younger brother of um, Uncle Bill, and their mothers are sisters. So my mother, my grandma is called Zipora, a younger sister of Elena was the mother of Uncle Bill. So back in the 80s, I remember I was probably in Form 2 or Form 3. During one holiday, I think we, August holiday, we traveled to Mombasa with my, with my dad on a work trip. And uh, we were with uh, my late younger brother. So when we came back, I think it was about a week to school's opening. We obviously, um, my dad would spend some time in Nairobi, again working from the Nairobi office. So he'd drop us off at Lavington to spend the day. 
and we happened to be sitting in the living room, and our oldest aunt, Math Lida, had visited, I think probably for, just visited, I, probably a medical checkup or had just come to visit, and uncle would sit on his chair and at some point his eyes would close, so you'd think he's asleep. So my, my aunt, uh, who was the oldest, asks him in, in Luo, you're sleeping and I'm talking to you. And my uncle replies, I'm, I can hear you very clearly. So then at some point, I, I, I don't know what informed, I think he was asking me about um, what we are doing on the farm in Kitale. We grew up in Kitale. My parents bought a farm there. And I think he was asking me about what we do on the farm, what we grow on the farm. And he told me, made a very interesting comparison about life in the 60s and life then in the 80s. And he talked about how back in the 60s, there was so much money that enabled them to acquire property. But now, I have so much property, but very little money. I remember that very clearly. And to this day, I wonder why you would have engaged somebody as young as me in a conversation like that. So I really wonder what he would have to say about um, life now and the dynamics now about property and, um, and the availability of money. Probably both are scarce, unless you're in the right <laughs> side <laughs> of the political divide. But anyway, yeah. So I, I, I just want to say a, a big thank you to a number of people. First of all, of course, to, um, um, to Uncle um, for penning down his uh, memoirs in a manuscript, um, his thoughts um, right from when he was a young man. I mean, it's been a fascinating book to read. Um, the stories, I mean, I've learned a lot. I have understood a lot. Some of the things that were jumbled up in my mind are, are now clear about even um, who, the, I mean, who follows who in terms of um, Omamo being the son of Onyuero and Onyuero being the son of Ongala and so on and so forth, Odero and Ongala and so on and so forth. Some of that has become very clear in my mind. So I really um, thank my uncle for having thought of penning down his memoirs um, in a manuscript that um, Bob was now able to use to come, come out with this book. I, again, um, just as Bob did, I want to say a very, very, very big thank you to the very instrumental part that um, uh, my aunties um, took in helping fill in the gaps, uh, Mama Joyce and our late auntie, Mama Anna. Um, they played a pivotal role, even the pictures, the beautiful pictures that um, are, in, are in the book. Uh, those are priceless. Um, and uh, we, we thank them for providing those. To the family, um, all the way from Tabso uh, to Andy, for the support that they have um, given uh, Bob. Um, uh, it was um, not an easy task. Uh, I remember Bob telling me that um, just using the manuscript to come up with this book was never easy, and even translating some of the things, um, um, making sure that the chronology of some of what appears in the book uh, was correct. Th that couldn't have been an easy task for him. Um, so I thank the family for stepping in and helping him to um, put things together in the way he was able to. I want to thank this institution, USIU and Alliance, um, for instilling in Bob um, the um, desire and the um, just the desire and, and, and the willingness and, and the, um, 
the mind to want to do this. This is not something easy in the days we are living in. I mean, people are pursuing the pursuit for money and wealth has consumed so many of us. Thank you to Fiona for being um, so special to Bob and for the support. I mean, you, you need a supportive spouse. Uh, Bob, I'm sure you can attest to that. Thank you so much. Um, um, yeah, thank you to our guests, um, PLO. Uh, it's always a pleasure to listen to you. Um, uh, sometimes I wake up at two in the morning and um, I'm watching your clips maybe in Ghana or I love the one in Kampala. In Kampala. <laughs> yeah, and to Barack, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Your words of wisdom, very interesting to read your pieces in ver various um, newspapers. Thank you very much. And m most important, to all of you who are gathered here today and to all who have bought the book and have read the book, I think they are vital lessons of life to take, particularly as Kenyans who are transitioning and going through this period of change that we are experiencing as a nation where we are really trying to um, become a nation and become one people. I mean, we've been so fragmented for so long. I hope this book helps to dispel certain notions that people have about various communities, about various people, um, and, and how they got to where they are. I've seen comments on uh, social media, <laughs> obviously by people who have not read the book and have had to step in and, and, and ask, them, have you read the book? <laughs> and what do you think now? Um, I wish one of them was here today. Um, somebody I know from childhood. So I, I thank you all very, very much indeed um, for buying this book and um, for reading it and for the lessons you'll take from it, what it will inspire in you um, what it can change in the way you do and in the way you think. Um, I hope that um, um, that the book will, will, will have that effect on, on, on all of us. Um, um, so that is my prayer. And, and last but not least, um, I, I, I just want to thank God, the Almighty. Um, I believe... I am supposed to say the final prayer? Yes, so let's be upstanding. I will now, my, my, my final thank you is to the Lord, our God, our creator, uh, who has made this day possible. Mighty and everlasting God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, the creator of the heavens and the earth, we bless you so much for the gift of life and for the breath of life and for enabling us, Jehovah God, to be gathered here this evening on this occasion for the purpose for which you have gathered us here. We do not take it for granted. We bless you, Jehovah God, that you chose this day for this occasion, Heavenly Father. We thank you for the planning that went into it. Jehovah Lord God, all the people who were a part of ensuring that this day becomes a success May you bless each and every one in a very special way, King of Glory. We thank you, Jehovah my Father, for Bob, Jehovah Lord God, and even Isaac, Jehovah my Father, who together, Jehovah my Lord and my God, took time, Jehovah my Father, and resources, Jehovah my Lord, to even make sure that this project came to fruition. Heavenly Father, thank you for the energy you gave them. Thank you for the wisdom, Jehovah, my Father, the patience, King of glory, that you have enabled them to finally come up with this book, a beautiful book to read that informs us of so many things, Jehovah, my Father, that can change the way we think, Jehovah, my Father, change the way we relate, Jehovah, my Father, change the way we view each other, even as um, a nation, Jehovah, Lord God Almighty. We bless you and we exalt your holy name so much, Jehovah God. I pray that this book, Jehovah Lord God, um, will um, 
be read by many, Jehovah my Father, and will transform many lives, King of glory. Father, we bless you so much for uncle, for his life, for a beautiful life that he led, and that he was a God-fearing man who understood that Jehovah Lord God, without you, he would not have accomplished the great things that he accomplished while he was here on earth. And so we just rejoice, Jehovah my Lord, because we know that Jehovah my Father, you, Jehovah Lord God, have allowed this thing to happen, Jehovah my Lord, and that Jehovah my Father, your perfect will has prevailed, Jehovah my Father. May you bless Bob, may you bless the entire Omamo family, may you bless each and every person that is here. Jehovah Lord God, uh, ahead of us is a meal, King of Kings, we bless you for the provision, we bless you for the hands that have prepared it. May you sanctify that meal even as we partake of it. And even as we shall continue to engage and to mingle, Heavenly Father, may you be amongst us, Jehovah my Lord, in our discussions and in our talks, Jehovah Lord God. And even when we shall begin to depart from here, I speak journey mercies and safety on the road for each and every person here. And Lord, may you bless each and every person as they go back to their various homes. And in this season of Christmas, I speak protection, I speak blessing, I speak safety, Jehovah Lord God, upon each and every family that is represented here. We thank you, King of glory. We worship you. We exalt you, for there is none like you. We have prayed in the mighty, blessed, and everlasting name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And everybody say... Amen.
Chicka, man, man, and I'm to talk, okay, okay, what chicka, man, man, and I'm to talk, okay, okay, what chicka, man, man.